So, hello, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, here is a session uh, to present my data and my data operators. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Dixon from Fujitsu. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Bernek. I'm a board member of My Data Global. Uh, in my spare time, I also work, I'm the chairman of Own Your Data, a nonprofit association here in Austria. And um, in my uh, professional work, I work for Frequentis. We are providing safety critical voice and data communications. Uh, this is kind of some background. Uh, very glad to be here. So far, I see, I think we have five people in the sessions. Uh, just want to mention, if you have any questions, please at any time, uh, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. I think it's quite nice to have a small group. Uh, if it is possible, please make it kind of a conversation. And otherwise, sometimes I tend to talk for hours. <laughs> and uh, feel free to interrupt me. And uh, yes, makes it a little bit interactive. Um, as a start, I thought maybe um, using a little story. This is actually um, something that happened was quite well known here in Europe. It was in June 19th, 2013. And you most probably know Chancellor Merkel. You see here from a local newspaper actually a picture. Uh, it was a very famous saying back then, eight years ago, that she said, well, Internet is a completely new territory. And uh, a lot of the people were laughing at her and saying, okay, we are young, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter. You must remember, this is 2013. There was no Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, there were no uh, election problems in the US uh, with Brexit and everything. This didn't happen. It was the early days, I would say. Uh, there was still the term Web 2.0. And Merkel and all the politicians were regarded as kind of the old folks who don't know what's going on. And she said, uh, yes, actually making fun of her when she said a new territory and they compared Merkel here with Christopher Columbus uh, finding a kind of um, America. But I want to uh, invite you, uh, making a little of a thought experiment. Maybe Merkel in 2013 was right. And actually, we are entering new territory. What is currently going on on the Internet, in social media, in the way how our society works together. And when we compare this, uh, the Middle Ages, basically back then, uh, when it was 15 centuries, and when we think about who were the most powerful people at those times, this was the Pope, this was the King, uh, having actually absolute power. And then we compare it with our time, actually famous people. Here I have Eric Schmidt, uh, back then, the CEO of Google, right now still a very powerful person. Here you see Mark Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook. So I think it makes sense to compare the power from the Middle Ages with some of the leaders uh, we have today. And if you continue our thought experiment, what were the end of um, the Middle Ages? How did we overcome the Middle Ages? There was actually Kant who said, Sapere Aude, dare to use your brain, dare to ask questions. Just don't believe what you hear. Just don't read the Bible and accept everything that you see. And today we have Kevin Kelly, uh, quite famously known for founding or one of the founders of the quantified self movement who said, okay, collect your data, understand your data. Maybe you can learn, you find, can find new insights. Don't just trust Google. Don't trust Facebook to provide you any news that they think that is the right thing for you. So I think there is some parallelism uh, there too. And what actually enabled enlightenment? This was the separation of power. So this is what uh, eventually led to democracy, so that we have a clear separation in legislative, executive, and judiciary uh, powers. And I think we can also transform this enlightenment and what happened there with the separation of power to a separation of concern for information that we experience right now. And I think a sensible separation would be to have the user who is kind of have the usage rights for some information 
and also actually decides how this uh, information is processed with algorithms. And this already brings me now to my data and saying, okay, um, this maybe you have seen this picture. My data actually distinguishes between the person in control, there are data sources, this is uh, the data, and then there are data using services, the algorithms. And actually what uh, my data did is it said, okay, because this is actually quite some complicated, some complex matter, let's have an operator. And my data operator supports a person to manage the data and the uh, algorithms. So, but this is basically three, four years ago when I did the first time this presentation. But then came another very important event. It was Shushana Zuboff who writes her famous book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And I think when we look at those back pictures, Merkel uh, depicted as uh, Columbus uh, finding America, we always use kind of the pictures that we are the emperors, we find new territory. But I think there is a big flow in those thinking. Because if we look a little bit more careful, couldn't it be that we are the natives? That we are just getting glass pearls and actually useless stuff from others and we are giving away gold and the most important things? So when we think about and using this analogy, we shouldn't assume, uh, even if we are fortunate enough that we uh, now, especially if you're here at TechUp or if you're active at my data, we sometimes think, okay, we know quite a lot and we are the emperors. I think we always need to make a step back and think maybe we are not in full control. Maybe we are the natives who are exploited. And this is just a kind of introducing now uh, this overall story uh, and actually kind of introducing you uh, to the idea of my data. And basically what I've also learned in the last year, one and a half years, uh, sometimes people quickly drop out of uh, any presentations and therefore I always put the summary at the very beginning and uh, what actually, if you want to take something with you from this presentation, it should be uh, a short message about my data. My data is an international organization that started less than 10 years ago and is really about a human-centric approach on personal data management. It started as a research project around 2013, 2014, and my data become really an essential building block for a fair data economy. So there will be now subsequent slides where I talk a little bit more about it. But the important thing is really this balance between the individual rights of the of a person, but also actually looking at companies providing services based on personal data and companies being successful in providing this data. So uh, this is this talk mainly about. Hopefully this wasn't a too long introduction, and still no one uh, in interrupting me. Um, but this is basically what uh, Dixon and me are going to present in the next 15 minutes. Okay, talking a little bit in more detail about my data. Well, my data is about a human-centric approach to personal data management. What is this? Um, imagine you as a person that you can sure that you can be sure that the data that you using, that you have access to, makes your everyday work easier, that you can really be empowered and have the freedom of choice, that it's not others having your data and actually manipulating you, but that you're empowered as a human. And finally, that you can also trust when you work with your personal data, that it is used in an ethical way. This is kind of the background where we, as my data, really see a human not being a little cock <laughs> in a big system, uh, but actually the human in the center benefiting uh, from all the data that is available. Um, in a nutshell, this is really about the control of data. Later on, we will talk about data sovereignty. So basically, uh, we have to exist the fact that we are now in an uh, information age, we generate a lot of data, we have access to an enormous amount of data, but the important thing is that we use um, 
our data in a careful way, in a sensible way, and actually also strengthening the digital human rights. So we have those human rights that you all know. And I think it makes sense to also now talk about digital human rights. We have now kind of an in the real life, our world, but more and more we also spend now, like we do right now, uh, kind of a virtual, a digital twin of us. And how, there should be also some kinds of digital human rights there. And there is this important, actually, uh, that this is not just about people, but also organizations. And we also should enable those organizations uh, to develop innovative new services based on those personal data. And my data actually provides a blueprint of these uh, six principles of the uh, My Data Declaration, how this can work. I already mentioned this, uh, so there's always, and I like this a lot about My Data, this dualism. On the one side, it is My Data is about people getting value from the data. And on the other side, it should be really about organizations and the ethical use of the data and making the use of data, the ethical use of data, the most attractive option. So uh, we know there are already a lot of business models uh, based on advertisements, based on, uh, don't know, uh, manipulating uh, votings and so on. But actually what we really stand for is the ethical use of data and making this the best option. How can this work? We have those three pillars. There's a very nice uh, strategy, the My Data strategy, in very much detail if you go to the My Data site. But basically, it is on three pillars. And those three pillars are from formal to actionable rights. So we have already, at least in Europe, but now also uh, in other countries, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, general data protection regulation. And this is kind of formal rights. And how can we transform this? abstract law into something really actionable. The next thing is from data protection to data empowerment. So we don't want to just have our golden cage and we are just protected and everything is taken care of. But actually we want to empower the individual, but also the organizations to actively use this data. And what we also um, really believe in that this will not work within closed ecosystems, but in open, open ecosystems, open data, and actually also open source software. Um, this is not something that is just in some little rooms, like I'm sitting here right now, or some obscure places somewhere in the world, but actually uh, my data is being adopted and is highly relevant on local level, on the national level, and also regionally. There are some examples here. For instance, the city of Helsinki, uh, I read about a very nice example where they said, okay, previously for uh, child care, it was that they sent out letters and uh, for small children coming to the kindergarten. And this was a process of which child is going to what kindergarten, how long it will stay, what uh, lunch meals are selected and so on. And this was a process that previously took eight weeks. And then this was changed to SMS. And basically, they just sent out SMS to all the parents. And they had what previously took eight weeks, finished, I think, 95% of all the responses within two days. So, and how this can be implemented also in a fair and um, privacy preserving manner was a very great use case. And this is actually already used. Maybe you have heard also about the European data strategy there. My data is uh, explicitly mentioned as an example how personal data management can work and should work under uh, this new European data strategy. It was also quite important, my data in the uh, Finnish presidency of the European Union. And there are also some other examples. And you find actually uh, quite a lot of information also in the news. Here is short uh, information about also my data, how it developed over time. So there was actually in 2014 when the first uh, white paper was published. I think another big milestone was in 2016, the first My Data Conference. 2018, uh, the International Nonprofit Association was founded. And yes, 2020, of course, we were also hit quite hard uh, with the COVID outbreak and had uh, end of 2020, the fifth My Data Conference was held completely online. 
Uh, My Data Global is also an ecosystem builder. Um, talking a little bit about numbers, yes, I already mentioned we are an international non-profit organization headquartered in Finland. Uh, right now we have about 500 members in over 50 countries and the important things that I already mentioned we have is you can either be a member as an individual or as an organization and we currently have about 100 organizations joining uh, having already joined my data being active. Uh, we have also local hubs and uh, thematic groups talking about this in a few moments and of course what my data is very well known are the my data conferences and I think the next conference will be um, next year, uh, 2022 will be the next, hopefully, if COVID allows, the next big My Data conference. Here you see, uh, I'm not sure if it's all, but many of the organizations uh, that are members of My Data, you see here Fujitsu, and also here's a small on your data logo. Uh, and it's yeah, actually really organizations from all over the world uh, joining my data. Maybe it should be, we should talk also about if we shouldn't have a tech up logo somewhere here. Um, speaking also about where our members live, we also, we have actually a quite strong uh, presence here in Europe. But also, of course, reaching out uh, to the US. We have very nice people here in the Brazil local hub. We have already a few uh, local hubs in the Asian area. I think the latest one that was founded is the Greater Bay Area. And also having in Australia, Africa. So we are on all six continents and actually we are very proud about that. Um, how we are organized. I already talked about the local hubs. There is also actually thematic groups focusing on specific topics uh, and working together on those topics. For instance, there's a Med Data Health group. Uh, just last year, or actually a little before, was the My Data for Pandemics um, uh, group founded. There's a very active My Data Design group. And one thematic group that is missing in this picture because we are very young is one group that I also co founded was uh, My Data for uh, My Data Literacy group. So, one important thing is also data literacy. How can we enable uh, individuals to understand when we talk about data, about algorithms, about data sovereignty? We shouldn't forget actually. In this circle, what we are here together, uh, we talk about this for years. We are very deep into the topic. But to make data and um, data sovereignty, all the uh, topics I mentioned, really accessible to a broader audience, we need to spend uh, a lot more thinking and do a lot more actions. Um, and this is actually what we are in my data literacy, uh, thinking about how to really grow um, the my data idea, but the overall uh, yeah, data literacy idea and how we can make it accessible to a wider audience. Um, here a few topics why it makes sense uh, for individual and for organizational members to be part of the my data family. Of course, um, I'm on the my data board. I want to invite everybody who is here now on the call and also reach out to others to join my data. There are really many benefits. Uh, and I think this is already uh, coming to the end on the my data presentation. Um, there's a lot of information online available. Uh, please go to the website mydata.org, read a little bit about it. Uh, I want to invite you signing the MyData declaration. This just takes a minute or two, but this is also basically a strong signal to say, okay, uh, we have taken the time and especially uh, the early founders of MyData to write a declaration with the six principles I mentioned before and to show a sign that they actually support uh, those six principles. There are a number of papers that are available, very interesting to read. And I also want to invite you to join the MyData.org Slack, a very active community uh, where you find anytime someone online, if you want to chat about data and my data related topics, uh, this is a very active community I want to invite you to. So those were, uh, we are now 20 minutes into the presentation, a little bit about my data. Are there any questions from the audience? Anything you want to discuss? I see we are now seven people in the session.
nice to see that a few more people have joined. If not, we have planned actually for this um, session not only talking about my data but also about my data operators. My data operators are organizations that are, com are committed to the principles of my data and provide solutions in this area. And in this presentation, we actually have chosen uh, together with Dixon to present uh, what we have done as my data operators and what are our service offerings. Um, so Dixon will then afterwards pr uh, present Personium. And from my side, I will present on your data. This is a non-profit organization here in Austria. And basically what we're doing, we were founded in 2015. And... Um, best described what we are doing or what is also kind of our uh, vision is providing data sovereignty that is for individuals and also for organizations uh, to provide means for having control over the data that is used in their daily life or in their daily business. When we talk about data sovereignty, for me, this is really about three pillars. This is about identity and identity management. So how can you prove your identity, especially online, when you exchange data, when you exchange information um, to prove your identity, to prove the identity of your business partner, uh, when you share data, when you donate data, so that actually you know whom you're interacting with. The second big pillar is trust and control. How can you trust when you interact with someone what technical and non-technical means are available and also what measures and what control mechanisms do have available uh, to verify this. And a topic that is actually uh, also quite important for me is linked data. When we exchange data that we have a common understanding of the data model, uh, that we have uh, semantically annotated data and we believe that works best with RDF data formats, I understand there are a lot of different other ways, but this is how we in Own Your Data uh, see a uh, sensible way to do it, and this is really focusing on linked data. For all the solutions we have, we have here uh, our key characteristics, so that uh, the solutions we provide are provisions, that is, uh, they can be hosted somewhere, everything we do, we um, provide via Docker containers, everything very important is under the MIT license, uh, license we developed, so this is completely free. If you have a business, you can include it and even use this commercially, uh, no problem with that. Um, we believe in a decentralized approach in developing our services. Uh, the fair data approach so that every data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, composable. Uh, if you work as a data engineer or a data scientist, you know you have actually quite a lot of different pieces. How can you uh, fit those pieces together, compose bigger uh, processing pipelines? Tradable, actually we have uh, solutions in our portfolio that you can buy and sell data. So if you have certain data sets, we did this for instance uh, for weather data, uh, out of the box that you can sell data, have a complete billing workflow. And uh, last but not least, everything we do is standards based. So we spend actually quite a lot of time looking what standards are out there and how and to want to make sure that really our products and our um, software developments are based on generally agreed standards. Um, talking about, so this is what is kind of how we want to do it, what is now really available. There are four products I want to mention. The most important, or where we spend actually most of the time, is uh, called Semantic Containers. This is a technology for secure and traceable data exchange. So if you have two parties being just individuals or also companies, how can those entities exchange data in a secure and traceable way? Another one is also a free service. This is a data vault. This is a kind of a personal data store is a general term for it. Enabling individuals to identify various data, collect this data, store it securely, and also process it. Uh, for the notary service, this is a small service, but I think a very important service used by semantic containers and data vaults. This is basically proving the state 
of a certain data set by providing a free API, but also a nice user interface uh, and writing data into a blockchain to kind of making it immutable and have a guaranteed timestamp. And we are not only using actual blockchain technology, here we're using in the backend Ethereum, but also uh, Eidos conform, so this is uh, legislation here in Europe to create what we call uh, trusted timestamps. And this is something, at least for the European Union, this is court proof. So if you have a trusted timestamp for a document or so, this is something that needs to be accepted uh, in court. Um, and this is actually quite important. So we found out we had some legal advice. It's not enough that you have, for instance, a hash, for instance, a hash value stored on a blockchain. So it could still be problematic because still for court and for law people, this is kind of new technology, but trusted timestamps. This is really uh, conforms to European legislations. Also a technic, uh, technological way to prove that a certain document was in a certain state at a certain time. And this is a free service that you provide this notary service. And then also last but not least is the weekly digest. I mentioned this, this is uh, something that came out of my data where we provide weekly information about what's going on in the personal data management world. Uh, it's usually four, five to up to 15 news stories that we collect on a weekly uh, basis and make available. Um, just now a few more slides and then I'm already coming to an end. Uh, to, so one slide per each of the technologies. For semantic containers, what is it basically? It is kind of a package. So the package what we use is uh, some Docker containers. And within this Docker container, we put data, a semantic description of the data, but not only of the data, but also how you're allowed to use it, so-called usage policies. We also put in the provenance chain a so complete uh, machine readable description what is the data history this is in the package and we have a complete api for authentication for logging it includes digital watermarking and so on and putting everything actually in a box to make data a commodity this is something that is uh, especially if you work a lot in the data science or data engineering department in a company uh, this is also what my background job is this is basically your daily work that you um, are interacting with data and this uh, is just a set of tools that should make your life easier there are also some out services on the outside so for instance you can validate any data that you write or validate the whole container of course we have this notary service where you can the state of the container, every action uh, that you're doing on the container, uh, right to the blockchain. So, of course, only hash values. Uh, but to prove it, we have, of course, those trusted timestamps. And as I was, uh, already mentioned before, there's a complete billing workflow. So if you have some data in a semantic container, that you can sell it to someone else and have uh, the complete uh, checkout process and everything handled there. Data folds, this is actually about all the data that is out there for an individual. Um, storing this securely in the data fold, we have end-to-end -end encryption uh, with um, asymmetric encryption. So not even we that we are hosting the data fold can read the data. And also you have plugins in your data fold uh, kind of gaining insights from the data uh, that you have stored there. Um, there's actually quite a lot of available information also on the internet. Don't want to spend too long on that one. Basically, because I've at the very beginning also mentioned Kant, this was kind of a guiding line where we said, uh, so Kant formulated those three questions. The so one is, what can I know? And basically, with all the data that we have available right now, it is actually really a lot that the individual can know right now. The next question is, what may I hope? So from all the data that I have, that I know my current status, says kind of a funnel, what is possible in our future? And the last question is that every human has, what shall I do? So that you actually set a goal for yourself and from all the data you have and your timelines that you have so far that you can say, okay, right now I choose I want to have that goal. You know, is this actually possible? And also that you can kind of data can guide you on the best way to uh, find a certain goal. Here's the notary service, one of the older services that are still online. I have put in here the links 
uh, how you can access the service. Uh, I mentioned this at your standard compliance, for instance, here, uh, the technologies that we're using, writing to the Ethereum mainnet, we're using Merkle trees to really compress all this information uh, according to this standard. We're using trusted timestamps. Um, if you want to try this service, I think it's one of the few services, free services out there, completely open source, uh, that allows you to write data to the blockchain. And then here the weekly digest. If you don't know it, or visit it here on this website. Um, it basically aggregates information from the MyData Global Slack, from Identosphere, and from Slashdot so far. If you have any other data sources you want to propose, please don't hesitate and reach out to me. Um, this is how the website looks like right now. We are right now more than two years old now uh, in a major... Uh, Redesign also with new functions coming hopefully this fall or this winter. So there's a lot of new stories uh, uh, associated with tags. We have more than, I think, 450 tags. So if you're interested in privacy, in the GDPR, uh, in data sovereignty, in data trust, you actually find all the topics uh, as well as the tagged new stories for data trust, for data sovereignty, and find quite a lot of information, can browse through this information. You know about the author of this uh, new stories. You can, you are, everything is linked to the original discussion so that you also get more of the context. And here you see some stats. Currently, we had about uh, 1,000 unique readers of each Weekly Digest issue. And we have uh, on the overall website, weeklydigest.onlyadata.eu, 3,000 unique visitors uh, every week. So this is actually quite nice after two years. And we have quite some audience who seems to value this information. Uh, and we're actually quite proud of uh, providing this back to the community. And then finally, I want to add uh, one piece that I've spent the last few weeks or months a lot that we are currently developing our own uh, DIT method. And as I learned that uh, the tech up, um, those tech up events are a lot about identity management. So this is kind of a teaser uh, for the community here in the talk with Dixon. Maybe we give a more uh, extensive talk on this in September that we actually developed now. And this is already also available as open source uh, on GitHub, a DIT method that we call uh, DIT uh, OID. Um, and some of the challenges, and we work actually a lot with identity, is um, when you maintain a DIT method on uh, and distributed ledgers on a blockchain. This is actually quite a lot of resources to maintain this information. And sometimes you have just data or you, when you have service endpoints, you say, does it really make sense uh, to spend this effort and store this on, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of nodes. Uh, maybe you are in a certain project where you use it, want to use a DIT method that is very privacy preserving and this is actually just the contrary of when you use a uh, blockchain that you say you are not comfortable putting this uh, publicly on a blockchain or maybe I'm right now have a small project in Ghana where we have a very unreliable internet connection so that you actually, those are all circumstances where you say it's quite hard that you want to use one of the available DIT methods. And basically we come up uh, with uh, an, another approach that using is completely conformed to the W3 DIT standard and uh, we are maintaining DIT and DIT documents actually not on a blockchain but on a local storage or this local storage can be of course on the internet uh, something a little bit like the DIT web method but we are actually cryptographically linking the identifier to the DIT method like the DIT key method does. And but the problem with DIT key is that you cannot do any updates. And there we also looked at the DIT carry methods that we have also associated to the DIT and audit log that allows you, and this audit log is again completely cryptographically linked to the DIT document and then uh, to the DIT identifier so that you always can resolve it to the last uh, version. So I think quite some interesting properties for a DIT method. Um, this is already implemented. I've put in here the URLs. There's an uh, early white paper. I think it's just six or seven uh, pages long. Uh, if you are interested, but as I said, this is just a short outlook 
uh, what we are spending quite some time working on now. We are quite happy. We are starting a project, a national funded project here on August 1st, where we also have uh, financial means in the next nine months to develop this further in the course of a digital immunization passport, what we are doing here in Austria. And this is actually quite some exciting news. And if there are some questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Otherwise, I think this is the end of my presentation. Good. Are there any questions or do you want to take over, Dixon? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, any audience want to ask um, Christoph about um, my data or um, on your data? And, uh, and probably um, next, not next month, but in, in September, um, Christoph will be uh, free again, and then uh, he will talk about more about the uh, the DIT method. So, uh, if you're interested in uh, decentralized identity, so um, yeah, if uh, no one have any question for now, oops, <laughs> yeah, please be in touch. Uh, and uh, okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead with my sharing of my my screen. So, um, so Christoph, can can you stop sharing, and then I'll try. So just stop oh, sharing. So, yeah. So uh, let me see. Cool. So um, can you see my screen now? I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. So uh, yeah. Um, so uh, co to continue the uh, the the third uh, the the other half of the uh, uh, presentation. Um, uh, we will talk about um, what's Personium uh, in Overview, and also I'll give you a short demo of uh, what I've been working on myself. So uh, um, please uh, bear with me. So I, I'm Dixon Seal from uh, from Personium Project, which is an open source and the only open source uh, personal data store platform in Japan. Uh, you can have different open source like own your data in the world and uh, in some other places, but um, uh, within Japan, with my own knowledge of um, um, with all the big enterprise uh, like Toshiba, uh, Fujitsu, and, and NGC. Um, Fujitsu is the only one that produces uh, open source for the uh, personal data platform in in in, the, in this area. So um, I'm the chief evangelist in this uh, project. And um, if you want to check out what what I've been working on for for my uh, for, for my for Fujitsu or for um, uh, for Personium, you can check out my uh, uh, Milo bot. I've been playing around with the Milo bot, so you can check out the uh, self introduction too. Uh, and if you want to um, get in contact and ask more about uh, what what Fuji's project is with the Personium, then uh, you can contact me through uh, the link in or um, uh, Twitter. So uh, yeah, so t this is because uh, last last week, uh, not last week, uh, in April, I already talked about um, uh, uh, my data and operators. So uh, this time I'll make it short. So uh, I'll just give you a very very uh, not over <laughs> overview of Personium. <laughs> Sorry for the wrong spelling, and and the locking daily activities of my own uh, personal data. So I'll show you that later on. So um, yes, Personium. Uh, how how is it different? Because uh, we, we kind of like start the project in. Uh, more than 10 years ago. And then as you can see, uh, uh, in, in this, uh, three layer structure, uh, um, we, we kind of separated into, uh, the unit, which is the, uh, the server and then the cell, which is the, um, the data store, uh, the data store, um, for the single user or, or, or organization. And then within that cell, you have uh, different kind of boxes that can hold different kind of data. So, um, we call it box. So, um, Basically, um, if you're quite familiar with uh, personal data or, or the latest uh, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, solid, then you'll find it it's quite similar to, to solid. And then we're kind of proud of it because uh, solid only work on it for a few years, but uh, we kind of developed it in the Fujitsu laboratory in uh, more than 10 years ago. So uh, we are the first one who, who has this idea of uh, doing personal data store in this kind of uh, three, three different layers level. So. And uh, within that thing, oh yeah, uh, just go back to here. So you can see that uh, the, the link, it's kind of like uh, interconnect within the cell, uh, which is the, uh, the the organization thing, or uh, within the unit. So it means that um, uh, within the same um, personal data surface or platform, uh, you can have your own customer or you can actually create your own unit for your own family. So uh, you can have uh, the father and then the wife or whatever have, have their own cell, or it can be... Um, 
connected to another unit, which is like, uh, for example, you can have your own um, personal data store within here in, in one area, maybe in Tokyo. And then if you're working with some other people in Europe, then uh, you have another unit that provide by some other service or, or he build his own uh, unit. And then uh, you can communicate with your coworker uh, within two different uh, personium cells. So y you can see this unit uh, or this cell it can be just uh, Apache server or, or, or whatever. So it's quite flexible that how you can interconnect uh, with other people, not in your own organizations or not in your own domain. So um, um, if we go into the um, um, the more functional elements of the cell, uh, the, the good thing about it is uh, we provide um, web API for every single applications or whatever um, um um, and programming to talk to your 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 cell, and then also um, each within each cell, um, um, the, the app provider or yourself can create some kind of very secure uh, spaces for um, for the box, which is um, um, assigned designated to the single box. So it means that um, if if you install some kind of a game application, then the, the game application will be will be able to um, manipulate the data. That's within that uh, certain area, and then um, for genome or um, mobility data, every every single one will be uh, working on its own data, and they won't be able to talk to each other unless you go in and then uh, use the advanced GUI to um, as assign different uh, role and and uh, permissions. So it means that um, um, if somehow accidentally you uh, you you install a kind of malicious uh, applications, and then uh, within your own personal data store, that malicious application can only mess around with its own city data. It won't be able to steal any information about your DNA or your game history or whatever. So uh, it's, it's totally safe. And, and unless you, you're stupid enough to release, uh, to assign more um, permission to that application, and then it, it start to cross and, and get more data. So basically by, basically by default, uh, you can the application can only mess around its, its own application. And then within the, the um, another uh, features about uh, Personium is uh, it kind of works like a Azure function or AWS function that um, within each box, you can specify some kind of special um, event and uh, and processing rules. It, it means that um, you can you, you can program JavaScript. Currently, we only uh, support JavaScript. So you can program your own JavaScript to look into your own raw data uh, event log or, or whatever in the data store and then produce, um, analyzations or, um, or what some kind of tokenization so that you can wrap around your personal data into some kind of data that is maybe useful to other people, but it won't, um, show any identification, uh, that links back to you yourself. So, um, you can do a lot of different things there. So it means that, uh, we are not just kind of a drive, uh, online drive that for you to put your data in and then share with other people. You can actually manipulate the data or someone, uh, because it's open source, uh, some other the developers can write the program and then, uh, help you with, um, with uh, analyzing your data. So one, one, one of the, um, uh, use case would be the one that I have. Uh, I kind of record my own daily work hours uh, to analyze how many overtime I've been working or am I working less enough. And then I also um, um, record um, each day how's my mood and health. And then over a month, I can I can kind of analyze that. Hey, I'm always like happy on Monday or Tuesday. And then I can do something about my 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 own my own health and mental health. So um, the la last but not least, um, the uh, special features of, of Personium is um, um, it's everyone is assigned a single uh, URL. So it means that uh, it's kind of like you have your own server. So uh, if I want to talk to my uh, doctor and then uh, share my information, the only the only thing uh, that the, the mo most convenient way is uh, for him to have another conv uh, another Personium cell so that. Uh, he will give me his cell URL and then I just link his URL and then assign uh, which kind of information I want to show him. And then every time when he wants to see it, he has to come in and then authenticate using OAuth 2 or, or whatever data we're providing. And then, uh, then he will be able, the doctor, the doctor, he or she will be able to see uh, whatever information I, I, I provide to him. And then, uh, as long as I don't like 
the doctor and they want to switch to another clinic or whatever, I can just um, uh, remove that assign assignment and then uh, the, the doctor won't be able to see my data anymore. So it means uh, all the data is within my uh, my personium uh, unit. So another thing with, with this URL setting is um, I can set it up so that um, I become the active data subject and then my son, which is still a baby, will be a passive data subject. So actually this um, um, this picture here is not, not my son because I, I don't have any child. It's uh, my manager's son. So uh, he's been developing it 10 years ago. So now, right now his son is like in uh, high school. <laughs> so, so the thing is like, um, you, you can have something that you monitor and help putting all the information and memories in the cell for the son. And then after, uh, when he's uh, grow up, then uh, you, you change your, your, your active role back to the son so that the son can manage the data themselves. So if we look at it this way, then it means um, you can always use the, the PDS to, uh, to monitor your, your dog your, or your car so that uh, whenever uh, you, you buy your car, you create a new um, uh, PDS account for it. And then you put all the information about all change or accident, insurance, whatever, uh, which is for the car, you put it in there. And then anything belongs to you, you put it in your own cell. So when you sell your car as a second hand to some other people, then you just pass on this um, um, car information to other guy so that uh, the people can get all the history of the car, but without any um, details from your own um, credit card or whatever from, from your own PDS. So you totally separate two different things in uh, in two different um, data subjects. So, so the, the, to summarize it, so uh, um, uh, Personium is a human-centric control kind of way that allows you, each individual, uh, to manage their own data uh, by yourself. And then you can select what data you can share. And then you can stop sharing anytime you want. So uh, um, it's not for granted you, you share it to someone and then afterwards uh, you, you cannot unshare anymore. And then also it's uh, privacy by design. Uh, anything you put in initially is always uh, only be available by yourself. So you, you don't have to share to anyone at all. And then, um, uh, and also uh, since all the data is in, within yourself and then as I, as I said, uh, explained earlier, you can have your own um, engine script that uh, JavaScript to, to write and then manipulate with your own data. It means that uh, you can always borrow some other people's uh, um, personal AI Programming and then put it into your own, you put it into your own PDS and then um, evaluate it and cross check your personal data privately. So that it means you don't even have to share your data to someone else. So it's some kind of a, a form of uh, edge programming in, in that case. So so and and also if you're using some other people's engine, it means uh, since it's a JavaScript. So uh, if you don't know JavaScript, you can always download it and then show it to your friend and then ask them for. Um, uh, technical um, analysis so to see if, if 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 that engine is stealing your data to someone else. So everyone, every, everything everything is like uh, open source. So uh, last one of this uh, special thing, it's like um, it's uh, permission and transparency. And uh, like like I just I think I just said it's uh, you can choose who to share, so it's quite uh, transparent. And then uh, when you share, it's like uh, it can be read only or, or write permissions, and then. Here you also select anywhere um, a file or or, or uh, some table, um, whatever uh, you want to share. So um, to and it's short. Uh, before my demo, um, actually um, in in Fujitsu we we kind of like uh, work. Uh, they uh, we provide this platform and then to help people or the economy to 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 uh, to do, um, uh, over, overcome their obstacles in uh, different areas so in public health care finance and everything so um, and from from uh, 2011 uh, we are doing a lot of POC but since uh, the economy I think uh, globally is still not quite sure how to use uh, the um, the personal data store so uh, it, we're still looking for some permanent service so if you're interested into what kind of service or, or POC that we are working on uh, you can go to the uh, Personium Projects English, and then, or you can just ask me, and then uh, we, we can talk about it in, in any other off time. So, um, one of the things that uh, I think it's good for using this PDS is like, uh, uh, for example, you can have a um, government portal that uh, you 
uh, you just put whatever information once in there and then afterwards if some guy from uh, the housing center or housing officer that uh, you want to share your um, you want to apply for some housing um, allowance then you just share your um, identification your family structure and then your address to, to, to that officer and then if you're uh, if you're filing your report for the uh, um, taxations then uh, you don't have to rewrite the whole information again you just kind of share whatever is inside your PDS, uh, like the PDS, uh, like the uh, identifications and the bank only. So uh, you, you're sharing the same ID, which is from the same uh, uh, data store. So it's quite uh, easier for you to do. So if we think of it, uh, if every single um, government port uh, government uh, departments uh, make good use of this PDS, it means that uh, normally what it will take uh, the whole process of several weeks to uh, to check out the informations and then come back and forth with different uh, uh, offers, then maybe it can short it, shorten it down into uh, a few days. So it will be a big improvement of the well-being of the user it's himself or herself. And uh, yeah, and also um, if, if you're interested into European um, going, um, 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 actually we, we kind of provide uh, the PTS solution uh, as an options options to the Helsinki project. So uh, if you want to know more, uh, you can ask me or check on the uh, my my uh, city as my data operator project from the internet. So you, you will be able to find my uh, uh, medium um, blocks. So uh, that that's all for the presentation. And then I'll show you the um, demo, which is uh, it only take a few few minutes. Hold on, I'll unshare my. Uh, Oopsie. Uh, so I'll share my application. So uh, I, I'm not a very good programmer, so bear with my uh, like city uh, CSS or Bootstrap. So so as you can see, um, I, I create my own um, PDS under uh, my data issues. and then this is my my PDS, and uh, it's called ScanSuit.pds. So uh, um, in, in Persona, we support uh, Google login, so I can log in directly. Um, since I already have the uh, the token for the uh, um, my data my data Asia um, global, so so in here I have my own um, uh, dashboard, kind of like the uh, the phone dashboard. And then uh, recently, I've created my own live log, so um, I'll show you how it is. So basically, uh, in here, um, I will be able to see my list of work, uh, how many how many hours I've been working. And then uh, how many uh, in my daily daily mood? So sometimes I'm happy and sometimes I'm energetic. And but someday I will be kind of like in in the middle. So here I, I can see whatever I have. So um, um, when when I try to share it to public people, I can share it uh, with whatever I I select. So it means that uh, if I give them this URL, uh, they will be able to see. Um, several of the things that I open up for them. So you can see this. Uh, uh, right now, I didn't print it out. I, I just put it as a JSON, JSON format. So uh, in here, you can see that the first three of them is open. And then the, the, the fourth one, I didn't assign it to them. So it means uh, when they try to access it without any tokenizations, then uh, it's it asks, it's saying that it's uh, authorization required. So um, if I want to release it to the public, then uh, I just go to my... Uh, my advanced um, GUI, and then uh, so basically it should be able to uh, do it more more simply. But um, uh, I'm just using the, the very basic API to to uh, do this. So uh, uh, you can always do it much easier. So I go to the file, and then I think the fourth one is here. Which uh, let me see this one. So I can I can assign. Uh, for, for, for the purpose of demonstration, I just show all public, but I can always share to single uh, row, and then that row can be bind to any user that I assign to. So it means that um, it won't be public anymore. The, the user has to log in and then offer it himself and then uh, access my data. So now, now I make that public, right? So you can see, should be able to see the, uh, the one with the uh, July 14th. If I reload it, uh, it becomes available. So that that's the thing, uh, the basic things that we have for for Personium as a as a uh, things to 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 uh, 
record your own data and then and then um, share it with anyone else. So uh, this is one of the um, uh, the screen that I create my own um, data. So uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm looking for some kind of like uh, help 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 from other engineers uh, to help me um, make this screen better and also uh, how to get all this information and, and analyze it so that. I will be able to say, hey, uh, each month I'm always happy on Monday, Tuesday, and then I'm less happy on Wednesday or whatever. So if, if you're interested, uh, contact me and then join our open source. So uh, that's all for me, for everything. So uh, I'll get back to the um, uh, Christoph and everyone. So you, you, does the audience have any questions for um, Christoph and me? <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so let's see, Q&A, thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so if, if there's a uh, three, three minutes left, and, uh, oh, so thank you, Jay. So, uh, Jay, if you need anything from Christoph and me, um, I'll be here again tomorrow. Um, I, I don't know if there's any schedule that you can check, but, yeah. So please keep in touch in 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 another format also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, thank you, John. So um, yeah, and Christoph, thank you for doing this for me. And uh, <laughs> I know that <laughs> I know that you, you have a vacation to catch up to. <laughs> so thanks a lot, everybody. We, yeah. <clears throat> thanks, Dixon, for mm -hmm. to others. Thanks for your interest mm -hmm. and saying goodbye. Yeah. So um, yes, <laughs> connections is bad. Yeah, th thank you, Sean. So, uh, yeah, uh, for next month, I'll try to ask someone else uh, to help me out with this uh, uh, thing. If you, if 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 do you guys do like it, and then in in September, I'll I'll invite Christoph again to talk about his uh, DID projects because uh, he has been getting a lot of uh, good funding from 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 very famous um, um, Europe organization and community. So it it would be nice to hear him um, talk about. Uh, his technical uh, products uh, projects. See you then. Bye bye. Yeah. See you bye. So uh, we can finish a little bit early. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. So uh, yeah. Bye.